Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Single Audit and Yellow Book Update. I'm Janice Kaplan with the Marketing Department at James Moore and & Company, and I'll be your host today. With me to present are James Moore partner, James Halloran, and senior accountant, Ben Clark. James and Ben combined for over 30 years of audit experience with an emphasis on governmental and nonprofit work. So they've worked extensively with clients whose funding is subject to government auditing standards, the Florida Single Audit Act, and the OMB Uniform Grant Guidance. As you can imagine, their knowledge is a perfect fit for what we're covering today. Okay, with all that said, we're ready to go. So I'll hand things over to Ben and he'll get the presentation started. Ben, go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody is doing well and we appreciate you joining us for our last uh, webinar of this government uh, segment series that we've done this summer. Um, it's been a good summer doing these webinars and I know we really appreciate you attending if you have been one of our attendees in the past. And um, today we're excited to present to you um, a slew of information over some very interesting, or at least I think they're interesting, uh, single audit topics and some other things that are uh, happening in the world today. And James is also with me. James has been preparing, not the, he's not been studying the information, but he's been preparing a lot of dad jokes for you. So I think he is really excited to share those as well. So when it gets to his uh, part of the presentation, I'm sure we will hear those long-awaited dad jokes. But before we get there, uh, it's good to go over an agenda so far for what we have for you today. Uh, the first thing we want to go over is an overview of COVID-19 funding. Uh, we also want to talk about the OMB update memos M-20-17 and M-20-26. Also want to talk about the 2020 compliance supplement, long-awaited 2020 compliance supplement. The state of Florida single audit updates, we'll go over anything there that has changed um, and otherwise with Florida's state single audit act. And a few other minor uh, and various single audit updates. The 2018 yellow book changes, including for a CPE requirement relief. So if you need some CPE requirement relief uh, with respect to yellow book, uh, it is there for you. And we'll be excited to tell you about what that entails. And the last thing we can talk about is just a few other recent government accounting and auditing updates. So the first item we have um, to go over is just an overview of COVID-19 funding. It would not be a webinar as of late if it did not have to do with COVID-19. I feel like I've been on a number of webinars lately and a lot of them have to do with COVID-19. It's kind of the world we find ourselves in. And so we're going to talk about a few uh, specific and th uh, things that have happened with respect to COVID-19 funding to start out with. So unless you have maybe just not been paying attention or you're not aware, there have been a number of appropriations bills um, uh, doled out by Congress, so to speak, and all of these happened in March um, 2020. So if you are a C-SPAN watcher, um, I, I know I am one. I'm probably the only one on the webinar today that watches any C-SPAN, but that's okay. Um, your head was probably spinning with the rapid fire nature in which um, these various bills came out of Congress and were signed into law. You can see um, on the slide here the dates and otherwise that they came out and it was rapid fire indeed. Um, actually, if we were doing this presentation about two weeks from now, it is probably likely that we'd have another appropriations bill to add to this slide. So um, stay tuned for that, not for this slide, but for the news. So wherever you get your news from, there's actually more stimulus um, talks going on as we speak. So um, that could very well affect some of the things we're talking about today, but it's important just to kind of stay tuned for that and to kind of be aware that that could affect um, you even more than what we're talking about today. So to talk about um, some of the funding that has happened, in March and otherwise, it's important to know that really the all the funding that we're kind of talking about today and some other things happened as part of basically three appropriations bills. So the first one was called the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act. And that act was focused mainly on providing funding to federal agencies to respond to the, the pandemic itself. So this is more of like the health related items and not so much of the economic impacts. There was a small amount of money. And um, when I say small, I mean about 20 million. Um, you know, you've seen an $8.3 billion bill there, 20 million is not that much of it. 
um, but that was provided mainly to the SBA for loans to small businesses. But otherwise, this was mainly a bill to respond to and build up our health response to the pandemic. So the total cost of that bill was um, about 8.3 billion. That's billion with a B dollars. The uh, next uh, bill on this slide here is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Uh, chances are you should have heard of this act. Um, if you haven't, uh, well, exciting. We'll tell you about what it has right here. But this was the act that had was more of an economic response, not as much of the health impacts as the first one. But it did contain the paid sick leave that you might be familiar with, the um, some tax credits and some COVID-19 testing support, food assistance, and some unemployment benefits. The total cost of that bill was around $3.4 billion, again, billion with a B. And the last bill, this is a, the big daddy of them all, and the one that you're most likely most familiar with is what we call the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. Um, this is the largest of the three bills to date, and it is the one that most people, I would think, would be concerned with at this point. We could, me and James could probably do a whole presentation on just this one act alone, and we'd probably sit here for a few hours talking about all the various things that are in it. Um, but just be, just know that it was about two trillion dollars uh, in this bill, and included the now famous PPP program stimulus checks. Um, I'm sure most of you probably received those. If you didn't, you might still be hunting them down or uh, maybe you weren't eligible for another reason. Uh, it also contained the COVID-19 funding to various different agencies and some other various items. All told, at the end of the day, there was about 20 new programs created from these various programs and bills. So now we're gonna kind of take a minute to take a step back and look at the four largest programs that stemmed from these various appropriations acts. The first two we have listed here are the Paycheck Protection Program um, and the Coronavirus Relief Fund. To start with the Paycheck Protection Program, this is one that you might be familiar with as well. It comes from the SBA, the Small Business Administration, and this is the, the program that gave out loans to small businesses, nonprofits, uh, primarily 501c3s, and in the form of basically what would be in turn grants, because it would be a loan, but then if you met certain requirements and spent it on certain funds, it would basically turn into a grant and it would be forgiven. The most important thing uh, currently to note um, for our purposes is that for single audits, this is not subject to single audit. If you're curious where we're getting that from, that is uh, under a, what we call a GAQC alert, Got it, Government Audit Quality Center alert, number 404, and it talks about PPP not being subject to single audit. And so that's just something to keep in mind as well as if you receive some of those funds, we wanna make sure that you know they are not subject to single audit. The next um, bucket of money that we want to talk about is the what we call the Coronavirus Relief Fund, and that was about $150 billion, and that came from the Department of the Treasury. The Coronavirus Relief Fund uh, goes to governmental and some certain tribes, and this is also from the CARES Act, just like the PPP. And the important thing to note is that it is subject to single audit, so there are some single audit requirements to it, and um, it can only be used on certain necessary expenditures. Namely, it can be used to cover expenditures that are incurred due to a public health emergency uh, with respect to COVID-19, but were not accounted for in the budget, most recently approved for the state government, and were incurred during the period March 1st to December 30th. Um, and they could go directly to, to the state or the county. Um, I know James has some experience with how this is working as we speak. So I don't know if you wanted to jump in, James, and kind of give your kind of two cents on how these funds are currently being doled out as is directly or just to the county or otherwise. Yeah, Ben, one thing to remember here is for counties or any governmental entity that was greater population than 500,000, the federal government dispersed funds directly to the county or to that city. 
So in Florida, there's not a whole lot of counties or cities that were that large. So um, depending on what type of entity you are, you may be going to your county, and then you may also uh, be having to go to the state. So you kind of got to know where your money's going to be coming from. All indications that we know from talking to, say, in, where I'm in Daytona Beach, which is Volusia County, is that any single audit requirements, of course, going to be carried on down to the subrecipient. So as a city, you're going to be subject to single audit as well for these funds. So just be careful because you may be a, a small town or city that typically is not subject to single audit, which is that $750,000 threshold for federal um, expenditures. This may make you over that 750000 So just be on the lookout for that. Great. We're going to go on to the next two programs. So the next two programs are a little bit smaller than those, or one's a little bit bigger, and then the other one's um, a good bit smaller. So the next fund is the Provider Relief Fund, and it was $175 billion. And then the other one we want to talk about is the Education Stabilization Fund for $30.75 billion. The Provider Relief Fund uh, is different than the Coronavirus um, Relief Fund. That one is, like I said, $175 billion. It's through the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, it is, again, subject to single audit. It does have its own CFDA number, and it's mainly to provide it to government entities, nonprofits, and for-profits, although I will note that to date, most of these funds have gone actually to hospitals and other health care providers. Um, if you look on the Department of Health and Human Services website, they will tell you that mainly the, their goal with these funds is to support American families, um, health care providers in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And they are distributing mainly these funds to hospitals and healthcare providers on the front lines of the coronavirus response. Um, they are also trying to focus on areas of the countries that are harder hit, um, namely rural areas. So they're giving about uh, $10 billion to rural hospitals. And then they're also focusing on, on those hospitals that have been on more of the front lines or harder hit, so to speak. So um, if you are a healthcare industry person or hospital otherwise, um, just know that those funds are subject to seeing a lot of you might have already started seeing those funds and and those funds are coming in the education stabilization fund so this is through the department of education and it goes to state schools and institutes of higher education and so that their goal with this is mainly to support k-12 through schools colleges and universities um, during the ongoing pandemic and again this is like the others uh, subject to single audit. Uh, one thing we did want to show you guys with the Education Stabilization Fund is like other Department of Education grants um, or programs, or they have their own CFDA number for this program, but it has subawards under it. And the, usually the Department of Education will put subawards with a letter at the end of CFDA number. So it looks something like this. I won't read them all here, but you can see these are just a few of them. And there's some on the next slide as well that kind of break out which subawards go along with the CFDA number. The important thing it, or to remember is when you're considering uh, whether you might have a single audit or not, if you did get some of these funds, um, these are all considered one program uh, for major program determination purposes. So you would add up all the funds you received under these programs or expended, and they would all be counted as one program uh, for that. This is a few more of those funds uh, as well. And again, we just remind you that it is one fund for major program determination purposes. The other thing we wanted to show you is that the AICPA, Government Audit Quality Center, GAQC for short, uh, put together a nice summary, and I think there's a link in the handout there, of all the COVID-19 uh, programs and their CFDA numbers and otherwise. So I'm gonna pull that up real quick on the slide to let you guys see that. And I'll scroll through it rather slowly just so you can uh, see that. But this is a handout here that has basically from the AICPA that has all those funds listed, um, including Paycheck Protection, um, a Coronavirus Relief Fund, Education like we already talked about, and a few others. And so if you're interested in seeing more of that, um, just know that you can get that from the AICPA's website. Yeah, Ben, on the Government Audit Quality Center website, um, a lot of these documents, you do not have to be a member 
of the AICPA or Government Audit Quality Center to view. So they've been nice enough not to kind of lock them all down. There are other documents you'll see on there that are locked down, but most of these documents they've kept unlocked. So just the general public could go out there and get access to them as well. Yeah, and I know this this chart in particular is really helpful if you have any of those funds to kind of look at and see, you know, they have various notes on the side of it and some other various things on there that are pretty helpful um, since these funds are pretty new. All right, some other COVID-19 funding updates. Um, we also just wanted to, you to keep in mind that not only did they create new CFDA numbers or programs with the CARES Act and other um, appropriations bills that we talked about, they also added enormous amounts of funding to the existing programs or CFDA numbers. Um, we also wanted to note that uh, the Health and Human Services has 99 programs that received additional funding under the CARES Act. Uh, this is, I mean, it's just a massive act, $2 trillion, and those funds were added you know, an immense amount to those. So we can talk about, we'll talk about later in the presentation, some things to consider with receiving some of those additional funds, but just know that even some of your additional funding that you received thus far has likely been impacted um, by some of these appropriations bills. And the last thing before we get to our first polling question is that we just wanted you to remember that, so be aware that some compliance requirements changed for a few of the programs. Uh, due to COVID-19. And if you need more information, you'll probably want to visit those websites, the Student Financial Assistance Program, the USDA Food Service Program, and certain HUD housing programs all had a few compliance requirement changes that you might want to look into if any of those programs um, are applicable to you. And so now I'm going to pass it over to Janice um, for the first polling question. And after that, uh, James is going to be standing by ready to go with his first dad joke of the presentation. Okay, here we go. So we have our first polling question here. How many sessions of the summer CPE series have you attended? This is my first. Two to four, a handful of relevant topics. Five to nine, there were just a few I couldn't attend. Or ten, I haven't missed one. Now, just a quick note, you may need to exit full screen mode to view the polling question. It should be displayed in a blue box on your screen. So if you don't see that blue box, try and get off of full screen mode. We'll go ahead and give you a few more seconds to complete the poll. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close the poll now and let's see the results. Okay, uh, for about half of you, there were several that you went to, just a few you couldn't attend. 10% uh, of you were here for the first time. Welcome. And or at six percent, I'm sorry, we're here for the first time. Ten percent of you haven't missed any. Fantastic. And then two to four, a handful of relevant topics. That is thirty-four percent of you. All right. Thank you, Janice. Well, as as Ben's been kind of building it up, you know, I guess I got to start with some type of a of a joke here. But you know, do that. It's you know, people are on quarantine and things like that. I'll only be telling inside jokes today. So, so just be prepared for that. Uh, so a little bit about some Office of Management and Budget memos. Uh, there's a couple of them we're going to go over here, 2017 to 17 one and the 26 one. Um, what's important about the one issued on March 19th, 2020, the memo 20-17, it provided some flexibility with at different application deadlines, flexibility with SAM registration, um, as well as extending, and this was the big one that everyone was happy about, was it gave some extensions on financial reporting requirements, single audit reporting requirements, the single audit submission to the, to the federal audit clearinghouse, also allowed it some ability to charge salaries and other costs to programs that normally wouldn't be such as like cancellation fees for conferences and those type of things. Uh, so the bad part about this was they issued this in March. And as, as you can see, that was a pretty long time ago when we think about it now. So of course they had to issue a new memo, not too much long after that. And they issued one in June of 18. They issued the 20-16 memo, the 20-26 memo. And 
What it did is it got rid of a lot of the stuff in the first memo. So they rescinded a bunch of the items that were in the first um, guidance given about roughly three months before, but they did keep some of them. Um, it did give some relief for a part-time basis, you know, for those couple of months for some entities. Uh, one of the important items it kept, kept is the allowability of salaries and other project cost activities through September 30th, 2020. So it gave you a little bit of flexibility there, but you did have to try to reduce costs and as all possible is kind of what the language they use in there. So what they were trying to encourage federal recipients to do was to make sure that you're re reducing costs. They even was some examples that were given out there of trying to renegotiate rents or contracts and things like that to try to reduce the costs that were coming back to the government. Now, Ben's brought up for me here the, the memo. And uh, so it's a couple pages long, you know, you know th this memo as, as, as you go through it. And the, the first section there, the allowable project costs. And then the most confusing part, uh, when you look at the slide, was they didn't make it uniform on extensions. Before, everyone was given a blanket extension out for a number of months. So depending on your year end, your extensions will look very different. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide in the PowerPoint there, Ben. And so depending on what your year end is, so if you have a June 30th, 2019 year end through September 30th, 2019, you get 15 months. So for June 30th, 19, if you hadn't filed yet, you normally would have filed that, you know, by March 31st, you get to September 30th, 2020. Um, if you're September 30th year end, you get you typically would have filed your single audit by June 30th. Now you have out to December 31st. So those are our, our six month extensions. There are some people who with their year ends will get three months. So if you're an October 31st year end um, entity, November or December, you get an additional three months. So for say a December 31st, typically you would have been required to complete your single audit and submit it to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse by September 30th of 2020. Now you'll have to the end of the calendar year to December 31st, 2020. There were some that changed initially. Um, these year ends, um, January 31st, 2020 through June 30th, 2020 did have an extension, but they took that away with this memo that was issued in June. So if you're a, uh, anyone pretty much in 2020 year end, if that's where your fiscal year end is, there is no extension right now for submission of your single audit. Um, we haven't heard too much if they were gonna do an extension. They, there's more talk about it, but as always, as you guys know with her, what's going on, it changes daily. So there could be something come out next week or in two or three months as we get closer to those first ones that are, that are due. I'm assuming there might be some movement on that potentially, but it'd probably be more like in early fall, maybe September or October, um, maybe before we see any talk about extension. So the AICPA also issued some guidance uh, related to various COVID-related extension deadlines. And um, so we provided a, a link here to that and Ben's gonna bring it up here. And, and this is nice because it kind of gives you a summary for different things, talking about the single audit. There's a number of HUD programs that got additional extensions, depending on the type of HUD program you have. You know, for HUD lenders, you know, original due date was March 31st. They gave that a one month. For Jenny May lenders, it was a one month extension. Public housing agencies, um, those depending on your original due date, you know, you, you got a couple more months there as well. So it's a nice little summary of all the different um, extensions that were issued by the federal government, you know, from various departments, and then has kind of a summary of those slides that I just presented as well. And this is available up on the AICPA Government Audit Quality Center website as well. So some more memos, of course, the Office of Management Budget, budget they're always gonna be having some new and interesting stuff. Um, the first one here, 20-11, provided some you know, relief for those directly impact by COVID due to loss of operations. That expires here coming up pretty soon. And then the 2020 memo that was repurposing existing financial assistance program awards. This was, however, rescinded by 20-16. So there was a couple of those that, that happened with that. 
Um, they also issued for implementation guidance for supplemental funding. So if you have any, it, it's always good to go out and look at those OMB memos if you have that specific funding, because they give you a little more guidance, sometimes have some um, Q&A type questions in there uh, to help you along in the process. So some common questions that the OMB has been getting is what did they mean by other available funding? You know, so this was kind of OMB's answer, you know, due to limited funding resources under each federal award, you know, water agencies must inform recipients to exhaust other available funding. So that was the question. Well, what do you mean by other available funding? And then also, as I mentioned before, to reduce operational costs wherever possible. So rent negotiation was one item mentioned, other supply type lines where you could renegotiate maybe that contract. Um, and then, of course, with anything grant related, you always want to retain your documentation of your efforts um, for how you reduce those overall costs. Also in that 20-26 memo, uh, one question that comes up is, you know, can you confirm the expenses paid with or applied to PPP funds cannot also be used to, for other federal grants? And everyone kind of knew this answer, uh, but, you know, the federal government never likes you to double dip on a grant. Uh, but that's pretty much what they came out and answered and said, no, you can't use the same payroll cost for that employee in two different grants and get reimbursed. They're not going to allow you to generate a profit um, off of the PPP funds. So talking about PPP funds, um, I know we have some not-for-profits on the call, some for-profits, some 501c3s maybe associated with universities that, that potentially might have gotten some PPP funds. You know, so the question that comes up a lot is how do you record this money? You know, what's you know what's the correct way to record this? And um, there's there's a lot of there's guidance out there, not not anything specifically definitive, other than the AICPA has issued a, a response through a technical Q and A on this, and it does give you a lot of uh, of guidance. You know, you really have two choices. Um, say we'll go through first for for a nonprofit. So if you're a not-for-profit organization, you could characterize this PPP loan that's forgivable at the end. You'd have the choice. Do I call it a debt? Because that's what you get when you receive it. You get a loan agreement from the bank that has a clause in there. That clause says that the debt could be forgiven um, if you apply for that forgiveness program. Um, so that's one option is you keep it as a liability on, on the books until forgiven. The other option out there is you analogize it to be in similar to how you would in a not-for-profit, which is it's a conditional contribution. Um, the conditional contribution is, is a little bit tricky and kind of I go on that slide talking about it for a not-for-profit is conditions and related to conditions are barriers. What are your barriers? So your barriers on a typical conditional grant would be allowable cost, which you're going to have here, which is your eligible salaries, rent, those type of things. You also have the condition of the application and applying for the forgiveness. So that's probably the grayest area um, that's out there is, you know, when do you consider the loan to be forgiven? And then that condition being released, and when that condition is released, then you have an unconditional contribution, which then is recognized as revenue. So for a not-for-profit, you would record that as deferred revenue or refundable advance, basically, um, on your book, if, if you did that, or you record it as, as a loan. So there's still more guidance coming out on the exact treatment of this. It's becoming a little bit hotter topic because there's a lot of governments. Of course, state of Florida has a number of government uh, not-for-profits. With junior ends, the state of Florida has a junior end. So those not-for-profits are looking at this saying, well, I have all these costs I incurred, but I have no revenue to offset it. So they're trying to kind of figure that out and match up the, you know, the matching principle that we all learned in our principles of accounting class of matching revenues and expenses. How does that exactly work? Um, ultimately, what you'll do is just disclose in your notes to your financial statements what approach you took 
And what was your rationalization for considering it a loan or your rationalization for considering it a refundable advance? OMB compliance supplement. So typically by this time of year, it's already out. Each year there is a compliance supplement issued for the uniform guidance uh, for Federal Single Audit Acts. And we usually have it by now. It's usually issued late, uh, sometimes maybe late June, the latest, but we typically have it by this point in time. Uh, we do not have it. We do have some indications of what's going to be in there. Uh, what we've been told so far, it's going to be in two parts. Uh, part one, they're aiming for a July issuance. So I guess they got about, you know, nine days left to get that out for the federal government. But, you know, you know, it doesn't matter when the federal government's late. It only matters when you're late. So we'll see what happens there. Part two will come out eventually. They're thinking early fall. So early fall, probably for them would be October, if we're lucky. And that's going to cover all the COVID matters. Uh, from an auditor side and also for an auditee side, the problem with that is that how do we know what to test? How do you know what to properly account for on your grant compliance side without the compliance supplement? Uh, so that's the risk that we have, um, and there, so what it could do is might delay some of the audit processes that uh, us completing an audit, because we're not going to have the compliance supplement to test back to that grant if it related back to COVID funding. So once part one does come out, which should be hopefully in a little bit, what we'll have is um, uh, there'll be the, the normal updates unrelated to COVID. Uh, it's still the six part, I mean, six requirement mandates going to be maintained in there. So we'll still have that included as part of the, uh, the compliance supplement. Then we move part 3.1. Uh, that was the part dealing with pre-uniform guidance. So that's going to re be removed out of the compliance supplement. They don't expect any big changes in the list for clusters, but do always check those uh, because if you have a cluster that was treated as one program, so you may not have one th this year, but you have a, may have a new program and that could kick you into um, having to test that as a major program in the following year. Um, the appendix is going to have some stuff in there dealing with the new COVID programs. And as always, appendix five is where you want to start. Because uh, that roadmap has kind of list all your different changes that happens in the entire document. So I always go to the appendix and start from there to look at what the changes were. So here's just a summary of some of the new programs uh, that are anticipated to be in the compliance supplement, as well as listed out some of the programs with significant changes. Um, SFA is student financial assistance. And, uh, some other K through 12 programs are slated to have some big changes. So just kind of uh, some things to be aware of if you get any funding from those programs. Part two, the matrix changes. Of course, we'll have the COVID-19 programs on there. Uh, we're also thinking we're going to have a background section for more COVID-19 requirements. Um, and there's, of course, you know, going to be uncertainty. We don't really know when this supplement's going to come out and uh, what those changes are going to be, you know, in the, in the, require, in the required um, compliance requirements. There's only a maximum of six that they can require us as auditors to test. Um, our risk is if we go through and, you know, I have a lot of clients we do interim testing on around this time period, is if we test what we typically would, would have, we may have to go back and request additional information or additional files because they may put an additional requirement in that hasn't been in, in the past in the compliance supplement. So James, are you suggesting that your clients delay any field work or how are you treating the auditing as far as this addendum to the compliance supplement? What are you thinking as far as an auditor? Yeah, I, it's gonna be on a grant by grant basis. Uh, kind of looking at the grant, seeing what the requirements are, talking with the client to see, did this receive any COVID type funding? You know, there's some grants that receive COVID funding. There's other ones that didn't. So you're just going to have to figure out for each particular funding stream, 
how much was funded by COVID? Do they know of any changes from their amendments they've received? And sometimes these can be delayed because the funds course sometimes will flow from the federal government to a state government, maybe to another agency at a, a state organization level and finally down to a local not-for-profit. So we, we know sometimes it takes a while to trickle down through those three or four different le levels. Okay, we have our next polling question here. What was your predominant reason for attending our CPE series webinars? Relevant content, free CPE, relevant content and free CPE equally, or James's famous dad jokes? And we'll give everyone about 10 seconds or so to respond. Once again, if you can't see the question box, uh, make sure to exit full screen mode to view the polling question. All right, couple seconds, we're gonna go ahead and close it out. And let's see what everybody says here. Okay, 60% relevant content and free CPE equally. Good, good to know. Glad we're filling that for you. 15% each for relevant content and then free CPE. 10% of you like James's jokes. I'm sure that makes him feel very good. But there you go. Wow, I am, I am surprised, James, that answer D did not get more support. So <laughs> go back to the drawing board on your dad jokes. Yeah, well, I had, you know, I had another joke, but about pizza, but you guys told me it was a little cheesy, so. Well, oh, oh wow. Well, before we lose everybody on this webinar, we're going to talk about everybody's favorite topic, which is 2020 single audits. Um, I have a little graphic there for you that you should appreciate, because I know everyone loves audit time and providing work papers and all the things that go into your annual audits. And so what should you expect for your 2020 single audit or regular audit? And I would say a challenge. What are some various challenges that you, uh, that you can't expect? Um, one thing to consider is just the nature in which these funds were released. They were released at incredible speed. I mean, if you remember back to the first slide, that was uh, over the course of a month um, that these three bills were put out. And really the way these funds worked is the funds were released and the rules were uh, written later, so to speak, and they were implemented later. And so what you what happened to do to that is nobody knew what their requirements are. There was numerous questions and uncertainty surrounding uh, many of the programs. And it even got to the point where the AICPA Government Audit Quality Center uh, wrote a letter to the OMB containing uh, various single audit questions submitted to date and i have that pulled up for you there it's um an interesting letter it's about nine pages long uh it has questions like subject to single audit ppp loans uh certain C cfa cfda questions compliance supplement issues major program termination it kind of goes on and on with various issues but it's something to maybe consider reading or looking more in depth to but it um it's definitely if anything it's uh cause more questions, so to speak. And so our only tip uh, due to that is just document, document, and document, and do more documenting. And so when you're using these funds for certain things or otherwise, um, just the better documentation you have, uh, the better able you're going to be to support whatever has happened with the use of these funds. There is also the potential to have uh, more single audits than in previous years. So if you've never had a single audit before, there is a potential that receiving these funds could put you over the threshold for a single audit, and now you'll have one, whereas in the past you haven't. Uh, there's also the potential that there may be new major programs. Remember, major programs are the ones that us as auditors test during the audit. So it uh, could happen that they're, the audit, you're used to your auditors coming in and testing one program, but because of some additional funding you received or some changes and otherwise, you're now uh, being asked to provide a whole different set of documentation uh, than you otherwise would have had to. Um, we noted that, yeah, for an example, many states and localities have received a large amount, like we talked about with the coronavirus relief funds um, that were directly from the federal government. So if you are a state or local government um, person who has received those funds, 
uh, it'd probably be good to just be um, in communication with whoever your CPA is, your auditor, um, people like that to make sure that you're aware of what you know is happening as far as the use of those funds and how they may affect you with regard to any single audit or other impact. So another potential thing is it could impact some new programs differently and it could impact existing programs. First with new programs, uh, it is a possibility that like I said, the new the new program could change what would be a major program for you. Uh, there is another possible change that it could mess up or or change rather your AB program information. So that may be fancy language, but for as auditors, we had to go in and call certain programs A and certain programs B. And, and in, in a nutshell, the A programs are usually your larger programs, and there's a, a threshold and ways of determining that. And the B programs are typically your smaller programs. And so we have to do different things with those different types of programs and how we treat those as auditors. So again, this is a potential change in that some programs could become maybe a type A program if they got, became larger, or it could be a B program uh, and otherwise. Another thing to note is that currently, uh, I've used that word currently, there is no requirement to select these type B programs as higher risk just because they're new. So just because you receive some new funds, we don't have a requirement currently as auditors to call these type B programs high risk. Um, it's not just a default. You still have to go through the normal process, determine if something is high risk or not. Um, some potential COVID-19 impacts to existing funds. Uh, it is noted that in uniform guidance section 200.51C that inherent risk was not a factor for determining type A high risk. Um, but also the type B risk assessments, um, you ought to go, as auditors, we'll have to go through those and determine whether additional funding uh, triggers um, new risk factors. So we'll have to go through a risk assessment as normal for type B and determine whether this additional funding is trigger any new risk factors. So that could change how things are audited and otherwise. And then we'll also have to go through the normal process to determine if any compliance requirements have changed with what we would have to test uh, due to these new or existing um, type programs. So what should we do, and we, I say we as the recipient of the funds, uh, to respond to these challenges? And one word we always suggest here at James Moore is communicate. Um, and by communicate, I mean communicate with your auditor, grantor, whoever, but definitely um, would be recommended to communicate with the auditor, and that will be a key um, Thing to do if you want to smooth out the audit process. I would consider um, some, some of the following things to discuss with them. How will these funds be audited? Namely, will they be audited remotely or will they be audited in person? Because that can be a lot um, different of an environment to have to audit in and have to be audited in. Um, I know at home, I work in the office about three days a week and I work at home about two days a week. I think James is at home right now. Um, and I know I usually have kids running around and things like that. And as fun as it is, it makes it a different environment for auditing and being audited. So it's an important thing to communicate with your auditor with regard to that, because not only are we auditing new funds, we're auditing in a different way than we most likely have done in the past. Another thing to consider discussing with your auditor is, are these funds gonna go on my CFA? Namely, we've talked about some CFDA numbers that are on these things now, and it's important probably to go ahead and upfront talk about, hey, there are some new programs that we've received and they have CFDA numbers or not traditional awards um, and discuss with them to on the front end to make sure um, everybody's on the same page as far as what is going on the CFA, the schedule of expenditures of federal awards and what is not. And then the other thing to consider is have we taken measures to ensure expenditures are not being charged more than one federal program like james talked about before the double dipping requirement as they call it um, we want to make sure that that's being abided by and that we're not charging things more than one federal program uh, with these funds coming out in such a, a fast nature that's something to be extra careful of and then the last thing on this slide to talk about is findings i know it's everybody's the least favorite word um, you know, I, I know my clients don't like when they get findings. I don't like giving them. But in the environment in which we find ourselves in, it might just be kind of something to keep in mind that that could happen just due to the sheer, um, you know, rapid fire nature that these funds came out in. 
And so hopefully you can just be in communication with your auditor regarding any potential issues that come up um, and hopefully you can work through those as well. But there could be a potential for more findings uh, than in prior years. The next slide talks about um, some of the COVID-19 oversight funding. So as part of these various appropriations bills, about $275 million was awarded to various federal agencies for oversight. Uh, something to be aware of as, um, as a recipient of funds, that there's various people that are um, charged with overseeing your funds. Those people were the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee. You can see their website there if you want to go look into what they're up to. The, there was the Office of the Inspector General for Pandemic Recovery, the Congressional Oversight Commission, and then various offices of the Inspector Generals and the Government Accountability Office were also awarded some funds. And so it is possible, and you should maybe expect that in the future, there will be um, certain agencies that will perform direct engagements on the recipients of these COVID-19 funds. And so if you get any of those requests, um, might be something to expect on the front end that that could be a possibility. We're still rather unclear about how or whether this will increase federal reviews of um, information or of audit work. And so it's just something that is a little up in the air at this point. And so at this point, I'm going to pass it back to Janice. She's going to do the third polling question. And then James has some more dad jokes up his sleeve. And here we go. What would your level of interest be in a similar CPE series in future years, assuming, of course, a post-COVID-19 world? Would uh, Very high. This was easy and convenient. Moderate. I'd attend some, but not as many as this year. Minimal. I usually get my CPE through conferences. Or other. We'd love for you. Now, this means we'd love for you to submit it via question. If you have uh, any other comment that doesn't match the other three, send it and check that off and then send it and let us know. So we're going to... Go ahead as uh, James debates whether or not to charge a cover and a minimum for his next webinar. <laughs> and, uh, all right, we're going to go ahead and close out the polling question. All right, and let's see what you all had to say. Oh, excellent. Thank you, guys. Very high. This was easy and convenient. Uh, that's 91% of you answered that. Thank you very much. We appreciate the feedback. Moderate, uh, 6%. Minimal, uh, two percent, and two percent said we'd love for you. You said that they have another thought, so I'll be keeping my eyes open in the questions to looking for your results. Well, Janice, once the bars get open again, maybe that would be possible, right? Yeah. That's, that, <laughs> well, that's perhaps. Possible. I guess it depends on where you are in the state. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, I did try to try to come up with a joke about social distancing, and this is as close as I could get. So, back on to our presentation here, and uh, we'll start with some State of Florida single audit. As uh, many of you know, the State of Florida also has a requirement for single audit on any of their grants um, that are strictly just state funds. Um, always remember when you receive a grant from the state, it could be a mixture. It could be a mixture of federal funds, state funds, and also the state can use their funds to match a federal grant. So they will go ahead and typically provide um, in the agreement what that breakout is. Uh, so always be uh, on the lookout for that. On your state single audit, remember your subject, if you expend greater than $750,000, uh, that was changed a couple of years ago to make it the same as the federal. And there are some different requirements on type A and type B threshold, which what that does is that dictates how many programs or projects we have to test on the state award level. So just be aware of that if you're an on, on the audit side. It's a different calculation for federal single audit than state single audit. So in addition, uh, the Auditor General each year will issue some updates, and this is primarily geared towards our governmental audience, our cities and counties. Uh, the biggest change for September 30th, 2020 year ends will be if you have a CRA, Community Redevelopment Agency, as part of your city or county, there is a new requirement that if that entity expends greater than $100,000 in a year, or has revenues greater than $100,000 in a year, it will be required to have a separate audit. 
previously, um, tip, these would usually be, there was an audit requirement, but they were fine as long as it was included in the audit of the city. Um, our firm took the position to include those as a, a major fund, which means we give an opinion on each major fund, uh, but they wanted some additional scrutiny on the CRAs at the state level. So now they have this requirement if it's greater than $100,000. And what we're seeing is people are either well in excess of that or they're struggling on their CRA just depending on when the CRA came in place. But this will be an additional requirement for 2020. So be sure to chat with your, your auditor about this because this will be some additional work that has to be done depending on who drafts the financial statements for that. In addition to the financial statement audit side, there are also some procedures that they're going to be requiring based on Florida statute 163.387, paragraph six and seven, and whether the CRA is in compliance with those. Uh, the first one, subparagraph six, deals with expenditures and whether or not the monies were expended appropriately. Uh, seven deals with the fund balance or basically what you're carrying over because you, anytime you have money left in a CRA at the end of the year, it's supposed to be really all reappropriated for a specific project going forward. Uh, so just be on the lookout for that. The Auditor General has not released the new rules, their, their draft rules for 10.55 or even for the June 30th type year ends, like charter schools, those rules are not even draft form are out yet. So we don't know exactly what the requirements will be, but we're thinking that the um, additional procedures uh, will be examination procedures similar to what we have to do now for investment statutes or for counties, what we do on, on some additional compliance procedures there related to last year. I think the new one was um, alimony and child support and some of those other items. Just a reminder, and I put the link in there for you as well, is last year uh, was the first year, if you had impact fees as a local government that you were required to have your chief financial officer, whoever that might be, your finance director, sometimes it's a town or city clerk at a smaller entity, has to attest to the fact that the impact fees have both been assessed appropriately. And probably more importantly for, for, for the governmental side is whether they were spent appropriately. Um, so just something, if you were not aware of that, that was required in your September 30, 2019 financial statements. And those impact fees, just remember too, it's not only if you have them, we've had a couple of cities where they have shared impact fees with their county. So they don't actually have a resolution or ordinance that they pass to adopt an impact fee. It was the county had an agreement back with the county where they shared a proportion of impact fees. Even in that case, it was still required to file the impact fee affidavit. So some stuff on uh, data collection form and Federal Audit Clearinghouse. I know we chatted about some of this stuff uh, before, but it's just some more information from Federal Audit Clearinghouse side, which is who you submit your federal single audit to. Um, of course, they're experiencing delays. Um, they, uh, of course, got some people working remotely and kind of struggling through some of those issues. So don't be surprised if and when you submit your single audit. It may take a little bit longer than normal for those to get approved on their side. Uh, the Federal Audit Clearinghouse staff is also looking at your, your, your caps um, and in some cases have been uh, rejecting them. So remember cap is your corrective action plan and looking at those corrective action plans, if that's if you have a finding in your single audit, you're required to have a corrective action plan. Make sure those corrective action plans are on the, uh, your letterhead. They should be on the entity's letterhead. They shouldn't be on the auditor's letterhead. Um, and also, we also suggest when you turn those in as well, if you have any prior year audit findings, those are also on the city or county's government letterhead as well. Um, they do recommend not using Google Chrome with their system. I use Google Chrome. I haven't had any issues, but I guess sometimes it creates some kind of issue inside their system. So, so you James, right, I, go ahead, I'll Ben. Google Chrome is a real thing, so I have had that issue. So. I would so agree. Have it. Yeah. Apparently Ben does more of that work than I do. So I'm usually at the point where I go and I sign off that it's that we're good to go. Um, so what do you use? Do you switch to Safari then or or Outlook? What 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 do you Internet Explorer? What do you switch to then? 
I, I usually just use yeah, the Internet Explorer or some other you know type of thing. But for some reason with the Google Chrome, there is a, a few applications within that uh, data collection form that do not, for some reason, work quite right. And I can't explain it. These things don't click down properly and, and some weird, strange things that are happening. But it only happens with Chrome. So it's interesting. I'm not sure why that is. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can ask Bill Gates when we see him next. <laughs> All right, so the, uh, when you go out to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse page, always at the bottom, they'll usually have some little pop-up that comes up that kind of tells you the new stuff going on. And that's also where you can see about any delays. Um, I don't know if I, I might have it on another slide here. I may, I can't remember if I talked about it already. But also, if, because you maybe were supposed to turn in your audit report and your or package nine months, that's the typical date, you'll still be considered a low-risk auditee with those extensions. So as I mentioned extensions before, either there was a six month extension for some year ends, a three month extension for other year ends. With those extensions, you're still gonna be considered a low risk auditor D. And the importance of the low risk auditor D status is what percentage of your federal awards that we're required to test as auditors. If you're considered a low risk auditor D, we're only required to test 20% of your major programs of a dollar amount of those major programs. If you're not a, not considered a low risk auditor, we have to test 50%. Uh, different than state, state single audit, you always have to hit 50%. They don't have a low risk, high risk um, status. So now a little bit on government auditing standards, uh, also referred to as the yellow book. That's what you know, I threw this one up, this up here to see they are keeping with this. I don't know actually if they print a book anymore, but um, years ago, probably about the time I started auditing back in 1995, around the yellow book timeframe. So that's why you may be wondering, why is it called yellow book? There's yellow book, there's blue book, there's the red book for schools. You know, we used to have all those nice little colors on our bookshelves. So some of the changes that are in effect for the government auditing standards, the yellow book changes, these are all applicable starting with June 30th, 2020 year end. So these are standards that your auditor will be using. Um, the biggest change to probably note from an auditor side and independence is related to financial statement preparation. So as always with any non-audit service, we were required to evaluate whether that audit service had, is, had an effect on our independence and whether it created a significant threat and then how we address that threat through safeguards. Um, the new guidance um, specifically says that if you're drafting a client as an auditor, if I'm drafting a client's financial statement, it's automatically a significant threat, but there are safeguards that we can put in place to overcome that and remain independent. Um, the primary safeguard over that um, would typically be either a second partner review, which is what our firm does. We have a separate, a separate partner not involved in the engagement, reviews the financial statements and, and the audit work papers. Um, you can also help with that as well if you have a separate team that maybe comes in and drafts the financial statements from the team that audits is one way. Um, another thing to keep in mind is your, your client's SKE, or uh, SKE stands for skills knowledge, is, cannot be used as a safeguard. Um, that skills, knowledge, and experience is not a safeguard back on the auditor's independence. It's got to be something as part of the auditor process. They also updated some uh, guidance on what type of findings to include. They also added waste. There was a lot of discussion back and forth of whether to include waste in addition to abuse. Abuse was already in there from 2011. So they did add that in there. Both abuse and, a, and waste, as auditors, we're not required to test for abuse and waste. What we're required to do is if we run across it in our normal testing, um, then there's procedures we go through to look into that, how we report it back on the financial statements. When you see a, a single, uh, not a single auditor, but a yellow book report, that's the part, you have the part on internal control of financial reporting. And then there's the next section is compliance and other matters. So basically other matters is abuse and waste. So rather than put those out there, they kind of use the generic term other matters. So they did offer some relief for anyone who was short on their yellow book CPE 
So there's some guidance out there on that. It, it's pretty specific. So but basically it gives you a couple more months to complete any of your yellow book CPE requirements. Uh, State of Florida is on a junior end for, for their CPE. So I know that's what a lot of people kind of track their CPE on the same level. But as we're doing this webinar today, there's many other sources out there for, for webinars to be able to get people caught up on their yellow book. But they didn't want to ding anyone you know, just because they might have been, you know, a couple months short of completing their CPE requirements. So some other recent accounting updates. This was uh, GASB Technical Bulletin 2020-1 was just issued. And this has a number of, of interesting questions. And uh, I'll have Ben just kind of go through it real quick. If you go, I think it's page four, Ben hits the first question. So this is set up in a question and answer format. It talks about our resources from CSR, CRF, that's a coronavirus relief fund. Um, is it subject to eligibility requirements or purpose restrictions? I think there might've been a question earlier someone posed about, you know, what exactly is this funding that we get? Um, so it's really what this goes through is discussing, you know, what's the proper revenue treatment for these funds. So if you receive it in advance for these funds, if you go down to the next page there, then you'll see on the response side, you know, it's really considered a liability until all your eligibility requirements are met. You know, so you basically record it as deferred revenue. Um, there's also a question on resources related back to um, Department of Health and Human Services. And this is related back to your loss of revenue. So if you, if you have that situation, this GASB technical bulletin um, could help you out on how you record those funds. And then question three. Question three is an interesting one because what they were trying to get at is, say at your year end, your statement in that position year end, so say you're at June 30th year end and you haven't issued your financial statements yet, but then the federal government issues something or amends something um, after your year end. How does that affect your financial statements? You know, does it affect the recognition of that in the financial statements? And the short answer is no, as they put right there for you right away at, in paragraph 10, but you would disclose it. You know, so what they're saying is sub changes subsequent to year end don't affect back how you recorded something at before your year end. Because there were a lot of questions about that, about, you know, say they all of a sudden said, oh, well, now you could use the funds for something different, or say with the loan programs, the PPP loan programs, if there was some change in how those are going to be handled. So that's why GASB came out. And GASB is a little more definitive at times than FASB is what I find. I work in, in both realms. My, I primarily do governmental and I do not-for-profits that are grant-based. Um, GASB tends to be more direct and definitive on their answers, where, where FASB is a little more principle-based, kind of gearing towards more the international accounting side. Question four actually deals with the, the PPP program. That's the Payroll Protection Program. And talking about their opinion on it, as I talked about before with on the FASB side, there's a lot of options. Of, you could consider it debt, you consider it a fundable advance. Um, GASB, like uh, the other one, is pretty definitive, you know, uh, in, in what they're stating is, yes, it is a debt, it's a debt until it's legally released from debt. So until you get that thing back from the bank or from the federal government that says you no longer have a loan, it sits on your books as debt. As a conservative accountant CPA, I kind of like that. I don't like the the more gray area that, that FASBs may be getting into because you'll have people record it all different ways depending on what their motivation is. Um, so there is a, a question on question five deals with some more provider relief fund, health, health services grants, CARES Act, uh, airport grants and formula grants and whether they should be reported as operating or non-operating revenue. Just like normal grants, and if you have it in an enterprise fund, and that's what they're talking about in an enterprise fund, if you have grants that subsidize back your um, enterprise activity, those are non-operating grants. 
If they're for operating purposes, they sit in the, in the non-operating revenue section. If they were for capital in nature, they would, of course, be down in your capital grants and contributions section. So they were just re-clarifying that there's no difference in the treatment for these new type of funding, this new funding that came into effect. Um, it's really the same treatment as you've always had with your previous grants. So question six is the, is the last question. Um, dealing with uh, implementation of stay at home orders or should they should we have some of this stuff as extraordinary items or special items is really what they're getting at. And what they're really saying is no, we don't consider this an extraordinary or special item, you know, for these type of actions. Um, similar to kind of what they did with uh, for hurricanes. A lot of times, for, you know, for hurricanes in Florida, it's not considered an extraordinary item to have a hurricane hit Florida, unfortunately. And that's kind of the same logic they're, they're using here. Thanks, Ben. So not to be outdone, the um, state and local government side also, um, the AICPA developed some frequently asked questions and put them all in a big document. Um, some of the highlights of those questions, you know, were dealing with subsequent events, MD&A, and uh, you stay on that page right there, Ben, because what you'll see in the beginning part of this, I'll go through what's the financial reporting impact. So like for subsequent events, financial reporting considerations related, and you'll see the next item below is then from an auditor perspective, what an auditor should keep in mind. So you'll kind of, it, it follows that format as it goes through these various areas, whether it's going concern, items to consider new for your management discussion and analysis. There's stuff on fair value, capital asset impairment, um, those type of things. So it's very useful because both from a, from a auditee side, what you'll get is a little bit of insight of what your auditor is gonna be looking at and what you know, their requirements are. Um, one thing's just to consider as you go forward is anyone that has um, defined benefit pension plans, um, you know, this, this is course is going to probably affect those pension plans as i've been talking to numerous clients you know a lot of times you guys are already in the position your 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 bargaining agreements are already calling for and set in there you know salary increases um, that are going to be going up so that's going to increase your contribution at the same time we don't exactly know how the market's going to respond i know june over june um most entities had a slight increase uh, uh you know, they, they weren't at a loss for the year, but we don't really know how things will be in September. So that's kind of going to be the hard part is, you know, it's market conditions. You know, if your fair value of your funds are down, that affects, of course, then your net pension liability. So that's going to be, you know, some parts of that. You may want to discuss that in your MD&A as well. I think that I am done with that section. So Janice, if you want to take us from here. Yeah, sure. And we'll get to viewer questions in just a moment. But first, you'll see on your screen, uh, if you've missed any of our webinars, they're all archived on our government service page, the link for which is shown on your screen right now. So uh, if you want to catch up, just go to that page and scroll down. You'll see all the webinars in the series. and They're archived there for your convenience. So um, those are all the titles that you see there. Now, as far as questions, we do have a few viewer questions. One of them, uh, coronavirus relief fund is subject to single audit. For higher ed institutions that are subrecipients, does this go on the SEFA? Um, yes, it should, because I'm assuming whoever's providing you that money is going to make it subject to single audit, because they're going to have to um, have subrecipient monitoring for those funds, and they're typically going to make the subrecipient um, college or university be subject to those rules as well. Okay, great. And we also have another one here. A majority of not-for-profits and government statements may look worse if they have additional expenses this year, yet none of the revenue can be recognized. Do you expect any update or clarification related to the matching principle for these expenses, or will it be just a timing difference? That is what everyone is waiting for. Um, there was, uh, I know there was just something on the Center for Plain English got released today. I haven't had a chance to read it. And everything we've read so far on the FASB, this is on FASB, uh, GASB is a lot more definitive. On the FASB side is, 
what they're really just recommending is kind of what they do for revenue recognition is disclose in your notes to your financial statements how you came to your conclusion. So if you've concluded as a not-for-profit that you believe, or as a for-profit that this is a loan, and you believe it's a, it, it, it's a loan, and until the, you will disclose that it could be forgiven a portion of the loan, but until that time, it'll stay there as a loan on your books. I can definitely see some advantages for that for a for-profit organization. If there's tax motivations, you, you, you would not want to recognize that revenue for as long as possible. So if it was a for-profit entity, I could definitely see a strong argument on, their, on, on that side for them saying, let me just keep this debt on the books until I get the formal forgiveness from the bank and the federal government, and then I'll recognize the loan. So what that would do is they'd have the expenses in one year, which is great. You're gonna reduce your taxable income one year and you push out recognizing the revenue. For a not-for-profit side, the issue comes down to the conditions. And it's whether you consider the submittal of the application for forgiveness as a condition. Uh, typically in the standards, there's a new standard that came out on grants. I think it's 2018-18, don't quote me on it. It's dealing with distinguishing between uh, whether uh, a, a grant is an exchange type grant transaction or a contribution. And pretty much all federal and state grants are considered contributions. And with those conditions, there's a criteria in there when you're going through your barriers that you say, is there just administrative reports required to be filed that are purely administrative and simple, kind of like, oh, I have to provide a, my 990 tax return each year or with some small, simple report that really doesn't take a lot to fill out. Those aren't considered a barrier or in, 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 in factoring into a conditional contribution. So the question is, does the filing of the PPP program loan forgiveness create a condition? Um, so that's going to be the decision people are going to have to make. Um, my personal opinion is you keep it on the books until you get that formal forgiveness. But that's James Halloran's formal position, not even probably James. <laughs> but I'm kind of conservative. So, you know, I, I don't I don't like to think the debt's been forgiven until you actually get something back in writing from the bank saying, hey, you no longer have this debt. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's all the time we actually have for questions. And thank you, James and Ben, for everything today. Uh, if you still have questions on today's topic and didn't get a chance to submit one, please feel free to contact James and Ben. You'll see their contact information on your screen right now. They're more than happy to help. Well, this concludes the 2020 Summer Government CPE Series, so thank you to everyone who has attended this and any of our other webinars. It's been our pleasure to bring this information to you, and we hope you found it helpful during these uncertain times. So have a great rest of the day, and please stay safe and healthy. Take care now.